Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar, the show about all things very north and very south. My name is Chris Barquart and with me as usual is Henry. Henry, how are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? I'm, I'm wonderful. After we fi fixed all the, the video technical issues, if you're listening to this as a podcast, again, this is... Uh, also a video we are recording this as a video and if, if everything works out we might even publish it um yes uh curiously polar we are um after the last time's public service announcement we're now back to the uh, music again we're back into <laughs> the public music. service announcement that sounds great <laughs> well that was kind of a public service announcement the the russian uh, oil spill which i think is probably still going on at this point so it's still is going on yeah yeah ev everyone who's interested in that go and uh, check out our last episode of uh, this podcast and yes we are back with uh back to the topic of music in the arctic and uh, you've brought us music of uh, a different kind of well what is it a tribe uh people no, it's it, it's an indigenous people group. So um, we learned in the second to last episode, um, I think that was one hundred and one. Um, we learned that Russia's north inhabited like forty different indigenous groups. Right. And we had that look into the Nenets group, which is one of them. And today, I want to travel a little bit further east and to the very far east of Russia, onto the Chukchi peninsula mm -hmm. let's let's put a map on the screen for that so here's the Chukchi exactly peninsula tell us a bit more about it and that's where the Chukchi people are home what we see here on the map is um uh yeah like the spreading of Chukchi tribes from um the end of the 19th century so you can see there are um quite some some splatterings of the uh, tribe of the well not tribe of the of the group of the people's group and we have two major different groups we have one coastal group and one inland group um and i would love to explain that a little bit in detail sure uh, a little bit later but that gives a very good overview um we see not so much actually the actual chukchi peninsula that's in the top right um, it stretches a little bit further. We see um, at the bottom of the map, we see um, Kamchatka Peninsula um, cut off and on the top right, the Chukchi Peninsula that leads into the Bering Strait. Sometimes this region is called the shore of two oceans and that comes not without reason. Looking at that map, we see that um, Shukotka, the region, stretches from the Arctic Ocean in the north to the Pacific Ocean in the east. It covers roughly 700,000 uh, 700, square kilometers, and that's an area slightly larger than France. And Shukotka is also the Russian territory closest to the US, separated from Alaska only by the very narrow Bering Strait, which we unfortunately can't see on that map. And I can't move it because it is a it is a picture. It's not it's, <laughs> it's not just in a, a in a map application. But if you if you end if you go to any mapping site and you enter Chukchi C H U K C H I Peninsula, um, you can find that. We just smart place it also in the in the show notes. Yes, there will be a link. So Kotka does have some diversity in its wide expanse. It's a quite huge area um, compared with France um, size-wise. West, uh, Western uh, Shukotka is um, plainly tundra and the southern part is classified as forest tundra. Um, forest tundra and tundra um, has or comes along with quite some wildlife. Thousands of deers live in the forest tundra and uh, one can also encounter both brown bears and polar bears. That's quite amazing. So you actually have um, both species uh, roaming around there. Uh, the tundra blossoms into a bright pictures, carpet of uh, flowers, mushrooms, and you have amazing blueberries and clapberries there. Ducks and geese, uh, ornithologists come um, come there to en enjoy that um, to the shores and rivers. 
uh, or to the shores of um, rivers and, and lakes. They are filled with salmon. It's a um, quite productive area there. It's truly a one of paradise. So from, from that perspective, it's definitely um, a coming up topic, uh, one of the future episodes to have a closer look into um, Chukchi Peninsula from a wildlife perspective perspective but today we want to talk about the people living there and their musical tradition of course that's part of the series but let's have a look in the um into the people first the chukchi as i introduced with the map are tra are traditionally divided into the maritime chukchi or coastal chukchi they have settled homes around the coast and live primarily from uh, sea mammal hunting and then we have the reindeer Chukchi, who um, lived as nomads in the inland tundra region. Uh, they migrate seasonally with their herds of reindeer. And when you try to figure out what Chukchi actually means, it's um, a Russian name that derived from the Chukchi word called uh, Chauchu, which translates roughly into rich in reindeer. So they actually... Um, the the reindeer chukchi distinguished themselves from the maritime chukchi um with that name with that uh yeah with that word and that was kind of um taken over by the russians the maritime chukchi called themselves um ankalit uh the the sea people roughly translated um the the ethnic group of chukchi people they would refer to themselves as Lu Ravetlan, which literally translates into genuine people, which is also quite interesting when you look into the language of the indigenous people around the Arctic. All of their self-descriptive names for their ethnic group um, circle around them as the real people, as the people. And same goes also for the Chukchi. Um, in the Chukchi religi uh, religion, every object has um, a spirit and it doesn't matter if it's animate or inanimate. And that's um, quite interesting to see. So you have a lot of um, spirituality in that uh, religion. After the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the from the Soviets installed state-run farms were reorganized and usually privatized but this process was so ultimately destructive to the village-based economy in Chukotka that the whole region still has not fully recovered from that so you have a lot of um, very poor developed areas in that region many rural Chukchi as well as um, Russian in the villages in uh, Chukotka have survived in recent years only with help of direct humanitarian aid and to understand that you have to um, try to wrap your head around that this huge area doesn't have a proper land um, connection to the western part of Russia so there is no proper land connection to uh, Moscow for example so if you want to go there you have to go by plane which is uh, quite a pain as well and um, takes you through nine different time zones. <laughs> By the way, to place this on the map, I have now opened a map here. Um, so the Chukchi yeah. Peninsula is um, pretty much right here where, um, yeah, we can see this is pretty much the area we're looking at. Exactly. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Good. you see the very narrow bearing strait um, on the east of the Chukchi Peninsula with um, little and big diameter in, in the middle basically How wide is the, that? that's like 20 miles right uh no i think between or maybe uh, a big diameter and um, chukchi it's 30 miles okay okay so it might be around 60 miles on all, all in all i think something like that all right anyhow um the date line goes straight to the bearing straight so um yeah we we actually start the day at the chukchi peninsula and we ended in Alaska. Pretty uh, nice to put it into context. Mm -hmm. um, 
in um, prehistoric times, the Chukchi people they engaged in um, nomadic hunter gatherer modes of um, existence. That means that they were more um, yeah, nomadic hunters following their uh, livestock um, around, at least for the uh, tundra Chukchi, for the one for living in, in, in lands following the reindeer. There are um, still some uh, differences between the traditional lifestyle and the coastal uh, of the coastal and inland Chukchi. The uh, former coastal Chukchi, they were largely settled fishes already and they were hunting uh, mainly on sea mammals. The inland Chukchi, however, they were uh, partially reindeer herders and uh, of course by that traditionally following the migration making their lifestyle more nomadic and uh, that changed a lot with the interaction of the Russians. The Russians discovered the area in 1600 something and 1720, 1730 Russia launched a series of uh, very rigorous uh, military campaigns against the Chukchi. The Chukchi were quite a group that didn't really behave like the other indigenous groups. The other indigenous groups were trading uh, trading furs um, with the Russians and the Chukchi didn't because um, the coastal Chukchi simply didn't really uh, collect any furs. They were just hunting for um, subsistence, so the, just for meat and for their own clothes, but not to um, trade further. And by that, the Russians uh, didn't saw any value in, in that group, so trying to get rid of the Chukchi entirely. Um, however, the Chukchi um, stroke, uh, stroke back and by 1760, the uh, Russian government I just decided that the cost of getting rid of the Chukchi was way too high in, in terms of money and troops. Um, we still have to run around the huge size of Russia um, and the difficulties to go from one place in the West to the very far East in uh, today's terms, not speaking about ancient history terms, uh, that's ancient times, that's um, a complete different story. However, uh, the Russians ended the war on the condition um, that the Chukchi stop attacking Russian settlers and start paying um, that kind of yearly tax they invented for the uh, Siberians. And um, in the 1930s, the Chukchi um, eventually were forced into state supervised um, economic collectives um in yeah in the times when the whole system changed into the soviet style system shukwaka became a region of uh, mines and gulags um which is a different term for concentration camp, uh, camps but those concentration camps actually were essential for the uh, mining and exploitation industry in uh, russia's far east uh, the rest of millions of um, Soviet citizens during the 1930s created a need for uh, those isolated areas uh, um, to, to to build those camps, and there was actually no better place than the Far East, uh, the end of the world, literally. Later in the Soviet area era, the um, Chukchi were um, the frequent subject of ethnic stereotypes, jokes told by Russians, and still are unfortunately. Um, beginning in the 1920s, the Soviets organized the economic activities um, of both coastal and inland Chukchi and eventually established um, a number of uh, collectively run enterprises. All of these were based on reindeer herding with the addition of sea mammal hunting and walrus ivory caving for the uh, coastal areas. But the uh, Chukchi were basically um, nailed down on the reindeer herding, which, as we learned during the last episodes, is kind of uh, a common theme in um, Arctic indigenous uh, people groups. The Chukchi were educated in Soviet uh, schools, and as a result, today we have almost a hundred percent literate rate among Chukchi people, which is quite amazing. And um, most of them are also fluent in uh, Russian language. Only a portion of them today work directly in reindeer herding that has become really just a minority. Um, sea mammal hunting has decreased um, as well. And um, 
very very few people continue to live their traditional nomadic lifestyles in their um, very typical uh, so-called yoranga tents which is basically a, a yurt um, similar to mongolian yurts However, the, the economy and um, living conditions in um, Shukhotka after um, the end of the Soviet era just remained very, very poor. Some improvements were made after the Russian billionaire tycoon um, Roman Abramovich became the governor of the region in uh, the year 2000. And he actually funneled billions of his own money into the development of the region's infrastructure. So that was kind of a push for the um, for the region, but it didn't really solve the economic problems for a region that far and remote. Um, because of the region's climate and um, economic conditions, much of the education uh, there in, in, in recent years has taken place in um, special, like like um, boarding schools. Um, which serves students from uh, huge areas. So if you have to, to bring in a, in a very um, sparsely populated, uh, very white um, spread area, then you just have to bring them into uh, boarding schools. That's kind of a strategy for a lot of uh, indigenous people um, among, uh, along the Arctic, around the Arctic. So these young people, they are raised in kind of population centers, um, often with technology they um, haven't known before and hardly can imagine themselves living in the tundra afterwards. So when you once get introduced to that kind of lifestyle, it's really difficult to um, go back. And um, for that, to understand that, I have to imagine that even in those uh, traditional Yuranga huts um, in, in winter the temperatures, even in sight, um, can easily be below zero. And um, once you figure that um, just an apartment block with uh, just general heat uh, makes a difference and it's very, very difficult to go back. The uh, Chukchi folklore includes a lot of myth about creation of the earth, moon, sun and the stars. And um, there are a lot of tales which are told among uh, Chukchi people um, about animals, anecdotes and jokes about um, uh, foolish people, of course, um, stories about evil spirits. Um, that's kind of a, of a very central piece in uh, Chukchi folklore, uh, the spirits. And there are a lot of stories about evil spirits that are responsible for, for disease or misfortunates. Um, of course, stories about shamans. Um, which have kind of supernatural powers. And the Chukchi also have many, many legends about ancient battles between them and the Koryaks, um, which is uh, the uh, indigenous group that lives south um, of the Chukchi. Basically, it mixes with the southern um, tribe groups we see on the map there um, in the north of Kamchatka Peninsula. And also battles with uh, Eskimo people. Um, during their rituals, the Chukchi shamans they fall into um, trances, sometimes, of course, uh, with the aid of um, hallucinogenic mushrooms. They communicate with uh, spirits and allow the spirits to speak through them, like we also um, learned that from um, Inuit shamans in Eastern Greenland. They try to predict the future and cast spells of, um, of, of uh, different kinds. The uh, Chukchi shamanism suffered less than in, in other regions. If you remember um, when we talked about the Nenets, we learned that shamanism was um, yeah, widely um, abandoned uh, through pressure of the Soviet system. That was a little bit different here um, because the, A, the shamanism activity took pl place home most of the time, there was no really um, religious organization to attack. And by that, it was relatively easy for shamanism to survive underground. Um, and second, of course, the vast area just made it very, very difficult to gain uh, control in that sense. However, um, there is um, very little research on Chukchi music on on the traditional music and the little music uh, little research we we find 
um, comes with um, with uh, a lot of uh, we have two different aspects in there which we also find in um, in, in other um, cultures and other um, groups of indigenous people around the Arctic and one is when we had a few episodes back I think in the second episode uh, or even in the first we started with uh, introducing that um, the throat singing and oh, that has I a that, yes yeah and that has a slightly different name here is basically the same thing and when you go into throat singing um, when you research a little bit about that then you will figure that this is like the probably the uh, widest spread traditional form of singing and um, I would say just let's have a quick listen into um, yeah the the Chukchi version of throat singing all right let's hear <laughs> sounded a bit like they throw they've thrown in some whale sounds or seal sounds there it's amazing you see there is um, <laughs> the similarity with the with the inuit version of, of throat singing so you you have the connection to nature so it's imitating natural sounds um but what's quite interesting when you um when you look into the different types of um, throat singing and in, in the arctic the won't find in the Chukchi people you won't find a male throat singer it's oh, really? entirely uh it's entirely a female thing yeah and it took me a while to figure out why and uh, it's a very easy reason um basically throat singing was um kind of a way for them to say goodbye and to uh, strengthen the spirits of the hunters when they went out to hunt um for food so it wasn't uh, the men throat singing; it was the the woman left behind, and just um, taking care about the children and um, uh, yeah, the little settlement. So that's something we actually find um, also in other traditional songs. And um, from throat singing, that's one branch. Um, we uh, go uh, one step ahead and um, dive into the uh, traditional singing which is kind of um similar to the nanets as well uh, if we remember the nanets have uh name songs where um yeah the, the the father or the grandfather just creates and composes a song for newborns and that song describes those um, um yeah, the, the character of, of that person and accompanies the person throughout the entire life and we have quite similar um, tradition in um, in in Chukotka as well. So there is this tradition of uh, composing song for um, for people, but of course also um, reminiscence for for nature for um, all the surroundings. So let's have a listen into the second snippet we have. Hmm. 
so we have different elements here. So the throat singing just um, it's completely missing here in that part. So it's a it's a proper singing, even though it's not really uh, vocalized. It's not really uh, lyrics in there. It's it's more like um, just a verbal expression. And we hear instrumentation. What does that uh, remind you at? Well, we have we've had several of these uh, indigenous groups using seal skins and things for drums, and uh, I I think that's a common thread through many of them, right? Exactly, exactly. We have a similar thing here. That's uh, the traditional drum, and that drum introduced originally for uh, shamanism just got introduced every day to uh, regular music and that dance for example that song was a, a so-called shell dance um, where uh, the, the singer was basically just um, praising um, shells along the beach and um, that's kind of a very um, widespread form of expression they have. So when you travel today to uh, Shukhotka, you still might find um, uh, groups who are just, um, yeah, yeah, just uh, presenting that type of of music. However, there has been a development, and there are a couple of bands um, of of rock bands who try to to merge all of that together. To so so you have kind of throat singing in um, in a rock band as we have uh, found in, in, in Baffin Island um, as we learned from, from Greenland as well um, you have the traditional um, drum sometimes implemented in there and then of course Russia's tradition was to um, create those um, folklore groups for the uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous people groups and we have also one here for um, the Chukchi, which is called um, Ergiron. And they have kind of a, um, yeah, they, they try to mix it with performance. So that you have a lot of those traditional dances included there. It's a big mix of um, men and women. Um, and apparently also uh, the, the men are uh, singing nowadays, so that has changed quite a lot. But um, within those songs, even though they are modern, you will find a lot of the traditional um, music. And I think that's um, a good way to um, yeah, finish the episode, to have just a, a snippet of the modern version of Chukchi music. And for those watching the video, um, there's also a website that we're uh, showing here, which is a, a bit of that dancing. So let's see how this goes together. And now let's, uh, now let's listen. And we put the, sh uh, the website also in the show notes.
this is a this is a much more modern take on all this um very different from the other ones i would say almost has a sound, sounds like it has a lot Be of different. western influences there It, it does. It's not only Western influence, it's also Mongolian influence. You, you hear there's a, a broad mixture of Oriental um, music and Asian music um, put together and then wrapped up with the um, traditional Chukotkin music. And then also using um, the Chukchi language, which is not really um, comparable to Russian. It's a different language family, it belongs um, to the uh, Shukhotko Kamchatkan family, which is more closely related to the um, native people of Alaska, for example, or uh, Northern America in general. So you, you have a closer relationship to them than to Russian um, in terms of um, culture and language. And um, we have to be a bit careful with those folklore groups, though. Um, we, we have learned that in the, in the past, um, music episode we talked about the nanets that those um folklore ensembles they fulfill also a couple of cliches and that's just something you always have to keep in mind when you when you watch that and when you listen to that so it's not really the type of of um, modern music you would say that derives just from let's say um, young folks just gathering together in a garage and start playing uh, music and just jamming. It's um, it, it tries to develop music um, with the traditional background. So there is um, a, a sense um, behind that development. But nonetheless, um, gives a nice idea of what kind of influences you have in that area. All right. Well, that's... Um... Another episode about music in the Arctic. We, I, I like how we're making this sweep eastwards. So we have uh, two more coming up. Really, two uh, more? Uh, yes, two more. I look forward to those. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess we're at the end of this episode, if I'm not mistaken. So thanks, Henry, for right. uh, doing all the research. This is. I have to say it again. It's not easy to put these together because it really means to hunt around for audio to get the rights to play them on a podcast it's not just you cannot just pick anything from the internet and use it um mm. okay uh, a few apologies especially for the um uh slower frequency right now we have uh switched to a every other week schedule for now um just because of time commitments uh also another quick apology for the sound in this episode i know there were a few glitches the internet is not very nice to us today so uh, but we are working on that yeah well sometimes that happens and uh oh. other than that if you uh want to hear more episodes of curiously polar then you can find us at our website curiouslypolar.com on twitter at curiously polar and on instagram at curiously polar um we'd like to hear from you and i guess that's it until next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.